Um, Deborah Cohen's going to talk to us now uh, a little bit more about uh, the sociological aspects of this and uh, some of what she's found out in her work. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for being here and thanks for inviting me. Um, my purpose tonight is to convey a set of sociological themes for all of us to consider. And I hope that later in the program we'll be able to dialogue um, about this. That'll be interesting. Um, I'm going to be drawing on qualitative research in sociology as well as narratives from memoirs on fatness, actually, because I um, do a lot with sociological memoir in my own work. Um, and I'm going to conclude um, sharing with you a little bit about the recent journey that I've been on with students um, examining issues of the body and issues of obesity. Um, so as a sociologist, I want to take us on this journey to understand how something as seemingly private and intimate as the body, as something that seems sort of natural, is actually really a public issue that relates to social structure. Um, our bodies are mediated by messages from various social institutions, such as the family, school, the government, the media, etc. And thus we can say that the body is socially constructed and culturally constructed and that our bodies are the product of complex social arrangements and dynamic social processes. So knowing this, we, begin, we should begin, I think, to ask questions like those posed by the sociologist Millian King when she says, what is a body? And what is the body's relationship to the self? What are the social forces that shape human bodies and bodily experience? And how do these forces vary in different societies and historical periods? How does our sense of our body change over time and place, in other words? Um, and how are different bodies perceived, valued, and treated? King claims that the body is the container and the expression of the self, the object of social control, and the repository of shifting race, gender, and sexual categories, so that the body becomes a site for asserting, imposing, performing, challenging, and destabilizing categories of gender, race, ethnicity, and sexuality. And issues of race and class have been alluded to on the panel already, and I'm going to try to explode them in some ways um, with this, in this very old-fashioned way, because I don't have PowerPoint. <laughs> so I hope that talking story around this is also interesting to people. Um, I'm really interested in the connection of body image and specifically obesity to this intersectionality of oppression. By intersectionality of oppression, I mean like racism, sexism, poverty, homophobia, and also violence and trauma, which are really near and dear areas to my heart in terms of what I research. Um, and studying violence and trauma always brings me back to studying the body. Um, so as a sociologist, I also examine the effect of media on the culture and this tyranny of thinness, especially for young women. A lot of my emphasis is on young women. Um, so my work with you tonight is to create this tapestry that shows how body image, obesity, emotion, and social structure are all woven together. Um, rather than talk about obesity as this objective social condition or a medical problem or an, ec an epidemic, as we've actually been hearing from the other panelists, I actually would like to offer another perspective, which is to take a step back and see how we construct it as such and how we respond to it as such. Um, because how we construct it tells us a lot about how we're dealing with it anyway. Um, in the book, A Hunger So Wide and So Deep, American Women Speak Out on Eating Problems, the sociologist Becky Thompson argues that women's eating problems are, uh, or often begin at least, um, as orderly responses to gravely unequal um, and chaotic and very disorderly structural conditions like <coughs> violence, like um, racism, like poverty. Um, if one conceives of the body as our sense of home, as our sort of safe place to retreat to, um, as a sort of sacred space, then Thompson's analysis is compelling for seeing how much of women's eating problems may be related to what I would call a sense of metaphorical homelessness with, within one's body. And when people talk about their eating struggles and their struggles with their body, they're often talking about a, a sense of the body not being a safe place. Um, I'm going to just, I'm sort of cutting as, as I go. Um, so 
I, moving on from, from Thompson to sort of thinking specifically about obesity, we can see that this um, suggests that there's something significant about understanding the very contradictory reality and paradoxical experience of the obese in our culture. Because remember, obese people simultaneously take up, they might seem to take up more space, so they might seem hyper visible in terms of their size, but they're also very invisible, and that's the paradox that I want us to think about a little bit because of how they're marginalized and oppressed. Um, there's great complexity even in these labels of overweight, fat, obese, and how people think of it themselves. Um, obese individuals suffer internally in terms of self-concept and externally in terms of discrimination, and they possess what the sociologist Irving Goffman calls a spoiled identity. Furthermore, the sociologist Howard Becker, who studied deviance, offers this term master status, which shows how some statuses in our society override others and take on the sort of certain priority um, and meaning. So here, in the context of studying obesity, we can see that obese people are seen first and foremost as obese. And then we think about their other characteristics and the other aspects of their personality. Um, Marcia Millman writes in a book with a title that captures exactly what I'm saying. The title of her book is Such a Pretty Face. Um, Marcia Millman writes that obese people elicit a blinding rage and disgust and are viewed as lazy, self-absorbed, lonely, asexual or bad at sex, and lacking willpower and self-control. So this creates a self-fulfilling prophecy since people often distance themselves from obese people. People tell fat jokes, etc. The memoirist Jean Brathwaite writes, quote, and this is really interesting. She says, when they looked at my body, did they see a mangled ruin that had once been a person, now grotesquely pinned under colossal weight, but horribly still twitching? And did they wish to get away from it, from me? One might observe then that the more isolated that obese people get in this process, then they use that extra weight as a form of what I would call body armor. And that's a significant part of what I'm trying to talk about, is this sort of scaffolding that people are putting on their bodies. And what is that about? That's not just extra weight, right? So it's a protective layer that ultimately inhibits um, emotional intimacy. In her riveting memoir titled Fat Girl, Judith Moore writes this, and this quote is really riveting. She says, the fat pads me like those heavy wrappers that movers put around pianos when they move the pianos from house to house. I am protected in my fat, protected by my fat. In spite of myself, I crawl deeper and deeper into the cave of fat. I add fat, pound by pound. I built walls of fat, and I lived inside. The issue of visibility is gendered because women are socialized to get pleasure from people thinking of them as tiny and taking up less and less space. And today we see girls um, and young women and older women too aspiring to be the size extra small or zero or now double zero as we're hearing about it. Um, and I'll ask you tonight to sort of just think in your own minds what I ask my students every semester, which is if zero means nothing, why are we aspiring to be nothing and to not exist? Um, and what does that mean about women's visibility and invisibility? Um, so in a culture where the size zero phenomenon figures prominently in female um, consumer culture, albeit next to these warnings about an epidemic of obesity, the juxtaposition oddly actually makes sense. It's not just a paradox, it really makes sense. Obesity exists as a form of social control, exerting fear that if you do this or do that or don't do this or don't do that, you too might become it, obese. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ow. All right, uh, quick. Um, in, a in a study, though, done in the mid-90s, Kim Chernin showed that of all the things people wish for, um, 200 out of 500 people wish to never be fat. And this is echoed in questionnaires that I give to my students the first day of school when I'm trying to um, get to know them as learners and as human beings. And nearly everyone on the question, what do you like about yourself or what would you like to change about yourself, everybody wants to lose weight or look different. And that is really interesting. So we live under a tyranny of slenderness, yet we're this culture with an obesity problem. Um, I am going to skip that and maybe save it for the Q&A if you ask me something that relates to it. 
Um, but we do have an obesity industry, and I think that that's um, an interesting thing to consider, and we can talk more about it, is how we're making lots of money off of creating an industry around it. Um, I think in the, I'm going to just almost skip everything. Um, I want to get to just one last thing. Um, I guess, yeah. Um, okay. So let me actually, I'm going to just fast forward to, because I was just told about the minutes. I'm going to just share with you what some of my students have <coughs> shared with me, because I think that that's the really interesting and kind of meaty part of what I have to share. And since I'm the professor <laughs> at Regis who's up on this panel, I think that's something that I can really share with you. Um, and it helps us think locally about this phenomenon. Um, I will say to you that I'm quoting directly from students, and um, some of those students may be here, some not. Um, I've gotten permission from them to share this, and they have been extremely generous emotionally and intellectually with this, and so my gratitude to, to you guys. Um, and I so changed their names, so all that kind of stuff. Um, but this is what one student um, said, and it really sort of shows how the sense of the body is gendered, it's racialized, it's um, our sense of our bodies affected by our families. It, it's more than just our bodies. So this one student says this. She says, I had body image issues pretty much for my entire life, but it became worse when I was a freshman and a sophomore in high school. In middle school, my parents told me that I was fat and that I needed to lose weight. Hearing the same story from my doctor forced me to go on a diet. I lost about 50 pounds between eighth grade and sophomore year in high school. I gained about 20 pounds back around junior year. High school freshman and sophomore years were the worst. I tried everything to lose weight and to make my parents and myself happy. I spent so much money on diet pills, which we know don't work and are worse, right? <laughs> Not eating as much, and my parents encouraged me to do track to help me get in shape. I was a mess. My best friend helped me get through those difficult times. And pretty much every day since, I still think about my body and the way I look. Since moving away to school, my parents still remind me that I'm chunky. They wanted me to join the college track team so that I could lose those extra pounds. When I told my dad that the coach put me on the sprinting team, he said to me, why would your coach do that? Doesn't she look at you? You're not fast enough, nor are you skinny enough. I remember when I got a C plus on a test in one of my science classes a few years back, and my dad said, quote, that's not good enough if you want to become a nurse. Nurses don't get C's. So you can, do either, you can either do two things, study really hard to get a higher grade, or lose a good 30 pounds so that a wealthy man will find you attractive and support you for the rest of your life. I'll, I try not to cry after hearing what my parents have to say, but that one hit me hard. It kills me that no matter what I do, I still can't please my parents, and they still can't see beyond, beyond my body image. <coughs> 